fantastic to be here. I have not been here before, but I pulled in the parking lot this morning, and it was full, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be so great, and I walked in, and it's full, and this is awesome. I am thrilled to speak alongside Kara, and if you haven't heard or met Jim Burns, you're in for a super big treat later this afternoon. Um, we did share together a few months ago at a different church, and the order was different, and I followed Jim, and this time Jim gets to follow me, and I love being able to introduce him because we have the exact same hairstyle, uh, and it took me a long time to catch up to Jim. He's a little bit older than I am. Uh, he's a superstar in youth ministry, and I've been in youth ministry for about 20 years, and when I started in youth ministry, Jim was a rock star in youth ministry, so it's just an honor to be here. Um, let me tell you what teeny bit about me, and maybe we can put my presentation up on the screen. There we go. Um, I love everything technology. I've got four kids. They love technology. My background is in church technology. Uh, right now, I get to go around to homes and businesses and help them with their technology. But because I have four kids, and I've been doing technology since before they were around, it's just kind of natural to be able to learn about filters and monitoring and tracking and how to keep them safe. And so I just kind of evolved into this space of helping parents with technology, being in youth ministry, having kids, and being a technologist all in one. So that's kind of where I come from. I come from a really, really big church down in Lake Forest, and um, there's a lot of technology there, and there has been a lot of technology there for a very long time. Let me share real quick a story about my kids. Um, Kara offered some fabulous advice about the dinner table, um, about driving in the car. She talked about how she brought some parents in, some adults in to help mentor her kids when they were 13. And I'm like, this lady is amazing. On a scale of one to 10, she's like a 10. And now I feel kind of like a two. Um, but we all have these, and, and as amazing as Kara is at sharing them, we all have these awesome things that we do with our kids, and I want to share one with, with you. I read a book by Bob Goff called Love Does a number of years ago and pulled a really little tidbit out of it that could have been in Kara's presentation about how to raise kids, and it was called The Ten-Year-Old Adventure. It has nothing to do with technology, but it has everything to do with raising kids, and that's what we're in here doing all this together. When my daughter was 10 years old, she's now 18, moved her onto CBU's campus last week, which was a little bit tough, um, but because we only live a few miles away, <laughs> but you can come over for Sunday night dinner, right? So um, when she was 10, we decided we're going to do a 10-year-old adventure. And I said, you get to go anywhere you want with dad, very little planning for three days, you get to pick. And I'm like, okay, what is she going to pick? We talked about it just a little bit, not too much planning. And she was into pets and animals. And she goes, Dad, I, I really love animals. I want to go to three zoos in three days. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. She goes, well, I want to be a zookeeper, so this is appropriate. So we went to the San Diego Wild Animal Park, and they had an overnight thing there called the Snore and Roar. So we stayed the night. And then we went to SeaWorld, and they had an overnight adventure where you get to walk around at night. So we stayed the night. <laughs> And then we went somewhere else with animals, and I can't remember exactly where. Maybe it was the Santa Ana Zoo. And at the end of the three days, she goes, Dad, this was amazing. But I've decided I don't want to be a zookeeper anymore. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? My feet are killing me. I've slept on the ground two nights in a row. I've seen more animals than I've ever seen in my life. She goes, Dad, Dad, calm down. I want to be an animal trainer. I'm like, oh. This is awesome. And that's my tidbit. I've since done the 10-year-old adventure with my other uh, two kids who are now 13 and 16. My 11-year-old has not gotten his 10-year-old adventure yet. So I'm a little behind the times. Um, I'm afraid he's going to want to go to Europe or something for three days. I'm like, that's really far. It's got to be local. But I would encourage you to try to get out and do something with your kids one-on-one, -on -one, not always with the siblings, not always with the other parents. It was amazing. And, and that's my little parent story for the day. But let's get into some technology. This is my lovely wife, Carrie. She's a children's ministry director, has been in children's ministry for as long as we've been married now, 22 years. Anybody know where this is? Oh, one of my favorite places. Not only is it one of my favorite places on the planet, but it's one of my favorite spots in my favorite places on the planet. In one of my favorite chairs, I had to learn what that chair was called, an Adirondack chair, because I want them and my favorite person in my favorite spot, just love Hume Lake, but 
That picture is just to show you that I married up. And there's my family. They are now 11. No, they're, they keep changing. Every year it changes. They are 12, 14, 16. And my oldest in the middle there is now 18. This is a little bit of a dated picture. But here we are, the Burnettes, doing technology. And because I get to go into homes and share technology with other parents, I have picked up a ton of information from parents much smarter than me. When my kids were little, I, I got a, a, a tidbit from another parent that said, hey, when your kids' friends come over, make them put their cell phones in the basket. And I'm like, that's genius. We introduce the basket in our kitchen and our kids' friends' cell phones go in the basket when they come over. Got that from another parent, didn't get it from myself. I'm not smart enough to come up with stuff like that. But I have hundreds of those types of pieces of advice that I've gotten from other parents as I've helped them along with technology. And we're going to talk a lot about it today. I talk fast and I have about an hour. So here we go. I'm going to try to cram two hours of fun stuff into an hour. And then we're going to end it with a Q&A. I love coming and speaking right before lunch because that hunger pain inside your belly is going to keep you awake as opposed to Jim, who's going to get you oh, sleeping after lunch. That's his problem. <laughs> In your handout, there's a little thing for you to ask questions or write notes. And what I'd like you to do is count the number of devices that you have in your house. Write that number in the handout on that box. It might be two, <laughs> not really, that doesn't exist, four, six, eight. You might have to take off your shoes and use your toes because most likely you have more than 10 devices in your house. Don't forget the Xbox, the PlayStation, the Oculus, which my 12-year-old discovered last year, 3D gameplay that nobody can see or hear except him, yikes. That does not go in the bedroom, that Oculus. Xbox, the Fire Stick, YouTube, man, the list goes on and on. So how many people have 10 or more devices of technology in their house? Everybody raise your hand, those of you who are not, are liars. You're liars or you don't know how to count. How about 15, who has 15 devices? 15 devices, we've got a handful of people with 15 devices. How about 20, do I hear 20, 21, 21 going once, going to 20 devices in your house? Anybody have 20, counted 20? In the back, sir, the guy with no hair, you, you have 20 devices. That's a lot of devices. Welcome to the club. There's a lot of people here with 20 devices. They just don't want to raise their hand, so hats off to you. This is a funny video. Give me a quick second to catch my breath. Check it out. Really? 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 Oh, I paused it right there because it's my favorite part. I love that video. It just kind of demonstrates how addicted to technology we are, and specifically our cell phones. I know I am. I'm a technologist. So I have my phone in my hand a lot because I actually use my phone like I used to use my computer. And my kids are watching me all the time. And I got to remember to put that thing down when I go home because I'm not at work anymore. My kids have theirs in their hands all the time as well. And it's a challenge whether they're four or 14 or moving out of the house. And there's a lot we can do with technology and sharing uh, the gospel. So I love technology. The, the far ends of the globe are gonna be reached for the gospel through technology. And we know that to be true today. So I, I have this love-hate relationship where I want my kids to embrace it and I want them to love it and I want them to use it for good. But the world also wants them to latch onto it and suck them into apps that are baloney and junk and screen time addiction. We're going to talk about all that. So here's what we're going to go over. Five areas of concern. I'm going to scare you the first 10 or 15 minutes. 
Four rules to consider, not necessarily rules I came up with, but parents smarter than me, like Kara and Jim, that I have heard that, I'm gonna, that I introduced to my kids when they were very, very young. I'm going to share three software programs that you can use to manage technology, three hardware devices you can use, and we're going to go over some common sense tips to help keep your kids safe online. So let's first talk about social networking. Uh, this is what social networking looks like to our kids. Everything they do has some form of social network attached to it. This week, my daughter and I have decided that we're going to go walking every night when I get home. 20, 30 minutes. We both need to lose a few pounds. And we decided to walk. And what happens when my daughter gets back from her walk? She wants to share it with her friends. She's got a Fitbit. The Fitbit allows you to share your walk. And when you share your walk, you get a little pat on the back. You get a little like from your friends. Well done. Good job. And that is highly addictive. Everything our kids are doing has some link to social media. So it can certainly be dangerous. Here's the problem. Number one, our kids are starting off social media way too young. There is an appropriate age. It's different for every family. Maybe it's 13. Maybe it's a little younger. Maybe it's a little older. But it certainly isn't. Instagram at eight. That would be a little too young. Creating unknown accounts when we give our kids devices, but we don't know the password, or we allow them to take it into the bedroom at night, or we just don't have the energy to manage it. They can create accounts that you don't know about. My niece created multiple Instagram accounts. Her mom only knew she had one and was monitoring that one, but she had three more. And Danger crept into those three additional Instagram accounts. Social media leads to screen time addiction. We all know that. I call it a digital slot machine. It's no different than going to Vegas and pulling that handle. It's a swipe. It's a swipe. It's a swipe. It's over and over and over. And whether it's TikTok, Snapchat, YouTube, it's just a swipe. And it is a highly addictive. If we add up the time that our kids use on social media, let's say a teenager uses social media for an hour a day, which I think in many families is a very conservative number. Do the math, 365 hours a year times five or six years in the house as a teenager. You're talking about thousands of hours you have lost as a parent as influential and you've given that influence over to somebody else. Whether it's a TikTok creator or their favorite YouTube creator or just a whole bunch of friends. Thousands of hours. So I'm not anti-social media. My kids use social media but too much social media robs us of our influence as parents. We gotta be very careful about social networking. Remember, I told you I'm gonna scare you a little bit. We're gonna talk about some of the solutions later on. One of the most popular ones right now is TikTok. TikTok, I think, is garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. It's robbing our kids of their ability to concentrate because they got these 10, 15, 20 second videos. They've got these creators that are teenagers. Half of them are creating just junk. And TikTok can be extremely addictive. It's not too much different than Snapchat. Luckily, there is another one that just came up about a year ago called Zigazoo. And Zigazoo is a TikTok-like app. I've got a couple of million people on it right now. And while I'm not a fan at all of giving kids social media too early, I am not a fan. But if you're in a family that does it and they're going to have it, then Zigazoo might be the replacement for TikTok. They're all, all the videos on Zigazoo are culled or approved by humans, not computers. It's all positive stuff. You only have positive emojis to share. Thumbs up, not thumbs down. Smiley faces, not sad faces. It's being used a lot in the classroom. Uh, and you know these challenges that kids get on social media? Remember the cold water ice bucket challenge that we did a couple years ago? And then last year you had the college age kids eating Tide Pods because somebody on social media told them to. It's just ridiculous. Well, Zigazoo has kind of taken that and said, let's do something fun. And let's challenge kids to show us a video of their shadow. And we're really talking young ages here, like 8 to 12 years old. And I'm not a fan of giving a child social media at 8 to 12 years old. But if they're begging you for TikTok, this might be a way to go in and say, I'm not going to give you TikTok. It's junk, and too much of it can be damaging. Um, but I will let you explore Zigazoo. That might be somewhere to start. Now, my daughter started out with Instagram at 13 years old. 
13 years old is when Instagram says you can have Instagram. That's in their terms of service. That's kind of a uh, privacy act protection age. And we used that to our advantage and said, I'm sorry, 12-year-old daughter. I know all your friends have it. She wasn't lying when she said she's the only one in sixth grade without an Instagram account. She was telling the truth. But on her 13th birthday, I think we went to Chili's and I whipped out my phone and we got an Instagram account. And Instagram was a great place for her to start as a 13-year-old because, number one, I could monitor it. I can't monitor a lot of things. I can't monitor Snapchat. But I could monitor Instagram. I could read her direct messages. That was awesome. I could make her account private. So Instagram was a fairly safe place to start our social media adventure with my teenagers. But now, if I was to do it again, I might go with something like Zigazoo. Just the thought. Uh, Snapchat is the number one social media app in high school uh, because it does the pictures, it does filters, it does news articles that kids like. It's a really cool app, but I hate it because of its addictive nature. I hate it because I can't see everything my kids are doing in Snapchat. So for that reason, Snapchat was a no. It was a no at 12, it was a no at 13, it was a no at 14, it was a no at 15, it was a no at 16. And when my daughter said, Dad, I'm, I'm not really going to ask you for Snapchat anymore because I know the answer is no, and I, I, that's fine. But at some point, Dad, I'm going to use it anyway, right? So we decided, I took a little piece of advice from a, a, a high school pastor named Doug Fields who said, as they get older, we're going to decrease the rules so that when they move out, they basically don't have any. So at 17 years old, we let my daughter have Snapchat. And we wanted to see where she was going to fail before she moved out of the house. And sure enough, not having Snapchat for five years, man, she went crazy. She went so overboard on Snapchat, it was like 10 hours a day. The first day she goes, Dad, I got a lot of making up to do. But at 17, she had matured enough to be able to use it to a, some degree of maturity as opposed to when she was 13. So we won't give our other teenagers uh, Snapchat. I can't monitor Snapchat. But I did tell my daughter, okay, you're 17 now. You're going to be moving out soon. I want to see what happens. Let's do Snapchat. But here's the rules. Number one, I'm going to have your password, period. End of story. She goes, okay, Dad, no problem. Number two, I'm going to put Snapchat on my phone. And anytime I want, I'm going to look at your Snapchats. She goes, but Dad, if you look at it and it disappears, then I won't see it. I said, so I don't care. That's a bummer for you, but I really don't care. I'm going to look at it. You want it or you don't want it. That's just how it is. She goes, okay, okay, okay. Fine, you can look at it. I said, if there's any inappropriateness, if you're talking with strangers, it's going to be the very first thing to go. We talk about grades and respect in our house. Grades fall, respect to mom or dad falls, Snapchat falls. That's just how it goes. Grades and respect. Everything's about grades and respect. I say, if you give me good grades and you give me and mom good respect, you can have almost anything you want. Almost. She did pretty good with Snapchat from 17 to 18, and now she's off to college, and she's doing well, and while we're still kind of watching her a little bit, we've kind of released the rope that we had tied around her waist, and we think we did a good job um, starting out at the age we started, and we think we did okay waiting until she was older, and it's not easy, and if you've given them TikTok and Snapchat and they're 11, it's, you know, pretty tough to take that back, but I would encourage you to do so because those two apps... Um, are going to produce some highly addictive um, screen time addictions. The newest one is called Be Real. And this one just came out. And, and I like it because it's moving social media into the right direction. So in Instagram and, and Snapchat world, we take five or six pictures. We make sure the lighting is good, we use a filter, then we throw them away and take them again at a different angle, we turn the cup facing this way, and we open the Bible up to this page, and yeah, this is my quiet time, and everything's perfect, and, 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 and our kids are learning, but that's not real, right? The way Be Real social media platform works is you have a, a, a circle of friends that are on this platform, and the timer goes off, and you get notified you have two minutes to take a picture, and you take one picture, and if you take two, there's no filters, by the way, there's, there's, if you take two, the people who are watching know it's your second or third or fourth picture. Isn't that crazy? The Be Real app takes a front-facing picture and a rear-facing picture, so you're supposed to kind of 
help share what you're doing in the moment, not a staged latte, not this is my vacation. It's just you being real. And while I'm not a fan of any kind of just throwing pictures out on the internet, it's ridiculous, I like the direction that it's moving. And it would have been really great if social media was kind of like this when it started 10 years ago. Now, the people who have used it, I don't know if it's going to take off, folks. It does have a few million people using it, uh, and it's getting very popular. But people are so used to taking a picture and then fine-tuning it for all of my friends to see. And our kids are used to that. And this is the opposite of be real. So I don't know if it's going to take off. But Snapchat and Instagram better watch out because this guy is coming up fast. And if my kids were going to use um, social media and I was to introduce it to them at a young age, uh, Be Real and Zigazoo might take the place of TikTok and Instagram. I like the direction that they're going while I'm still hesitant about social media in general and while I'm still very hesitant about it at a young age. So there's social media. Pornography is another big problem. When I first started in technology 20 years ago, this was the problem. This is basically all we had to can be concerned with when we gave our kids computers. My, um, my very first technological jump into this space was when I was sitting in the back of my church, Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, and and there's a few thousand people there, and, and our pastor gets up on the stage. And I'm on staff at this time. I'm an IT guy there. And I'm in my 20s, and I've got no kids. And I'm sitting in the back with my wife. And Pastor Rick says, we're going to give a web filter to everybody in the congregation. And my wife turns to me, and she goes, how many people are in the congregation? I said, I think there's like 25,000 people. It's the largest church in Southern California, maybe in California. She goes, wow, who's going to be managing that? I said, ah, the first I've heard of it. And for the next two years, I became Mr. Filter. That's how our pastor was. Just throw it out there and let the staff figure out how it's going to work. And uh, so for two years, I had to figure out, this is dial-up, folks. This is 2001. We were using dial-up then. And um, everybody needed a filter. So we found a filter. We bought a license for it. We gave it to everybody. It didn't work a lot of the time, but I became a filter expert. Um, and it was to block pornography. That was the first thing we had to do to keep people safe. Problem with pornography is our kids are stumbling across it on accident. You don't even have to go looking for it. You can type in American girl on Google and get pornography. Don't do it. But I found out at 12 years old that's not a good thing for a young lady to type in American girl on, on Google. Once they do find it, oftentimes they'll save it and share it with other kids. So it might not even be your child looking for it or stumbling upon it. It might be your child just being shown it by another child who found it or stumbled on it. And so these mobile devices allow kids to share porn very, very easily. They're saving it on the mobile device. And then, of course, we all know that it will lead to a porn addiction. And um, at a young age, uh, porn's not good at any age, but at a young age, it can be especially damaging. So we want to really work hard at the young ages to put filters on their devices, whether it's a laptop, desktop, mobile phone, we're filter, filter, filter. Whereas when we get into the teenage years, we kind of migrate over to monitoring. We want to give them a little bit more freedom. The filter doesn't come off. But then we start watching what they're doing and seeing who they're interacting with. We don't need to do that at seven or eight or nine years old as much because that's very boring and takes a lot of time. But we do want to protect their hearts. So that's where a filter comes in. And we're going to talk about a filter in just a second. Bullying apps, number three, dangerous thing to, that kids stumble across. A lot of these apps allow kids to be anonymous, and that's how they can be bullied. And maybe your child is going to get bullied online somehow, or maybe your child will be the bully. I've got four kids. Three of them um, are people pleasers, and one of them is more of the leader type. And my daughter, Madison, I have to watch um, my kids' technology because I don't want them to be bullied. But I have to watch Madison's technology because I don't want your children to be bullied. <laughs> Madison is the type of young lady that'll see a, a Lego thing, and if nobody's looking, she'll just knock it over. Oh, Madison, we're working on her heart. We're working on it so hard. <laughs> but sometimes you have to watch different kids for different reasons. And I seriously have no fears of Madison ever being bullied. She will squash your children. 
with technology and with words. My other ones, they have softer hearts, and I'm watching them for a different reason. The problem, it leads to self-esteem issues. It can lead to discipline consequences. And like I just said, bullying is done both ways. So we're going to watch the kids' apps that they put on their iPads and laptops and phones. We're going to watch them real close. And if we don't know what they are, we're going to ask questions. What is that app for? In our house, our kids are not allowed to create an account or a social media without asking first. If you put it on your phone without asking, it's gone, period, end of story. When my daughter said, hey, dad, can I have Instagram? I said, I don't know yet. Let me look it up. Let me figure out if I can make it safe. And then once I did and I found out that it, it could be made semi-safe, I said, yes, you can at 13. The conversation happened for a year before Instagram came into our house. And, the, and it's worked really well because mom and dad can monitor it. But um, if you're not looking at the apps they have or not having conversations about what they might be downloading, then some of these bullying apps can creep in. Uh, sexting is another big issue. Sexting is just simply sending inappropriate content, whether it's photos or text, over instant messaging or apps. Snapchat is a huge, big fat door into the world of sexting. Because you can do it quietly, you can do it secretly, you can do it without anybody knowing, and it can slowly, quietly kind of disappear. And just for that reason alone, we said no to Snapchat for a very, very long time. But if you're not aware of what these apps do and they sneak onto your kid's phone, even if they're just, I'm, I'm not using Tinder, Dad, I just want to check it out. No, we don't want to open a door for Satan to even put his pinky finger in our kids' lives. And so we got to be very careful about the apps that they're using, and that's why I'm giving you permission to look at their phone often and regularly. Now, it's very difficult to look at their phone if it's in the bedroom, isn't it? Very difficult to look at the phone if they're sleeping with it under their pillow in their hand. But it's very easy if you have the password, and it's very easy if it's in the kitchen. The problem with sexting apps is it definitely leads to in-person encounters. Those can uh, certainly happen very quickly. If you think your child's never going to meet anybody that they first met online, you're wrong because they're growing up in this world. We are social media immigrants. Our children are social media natives. So we think, well, they're never going to meet anybody online. Oh, yes, they are. They will at some point meet somebody online and then they will meet them in person someday. They're growing up in this world and it's not going away. But unfortunately... Social media is used by predators to find victims, so we're going to watch what our kids are doing. Kids view it as harmless. I'm in my bedroom. I'm safe. Nobody can hurt me here. It's just text. It's just Reddit. It's just a conversation with somebody, but it can escalate very, very quickly. So we're going to keep a real close eye on them. Over 50% of the kids in middle school have an app on their phone that can be used for sexting, bullying, or being anonymous. 50% of middle school kids have something on their phone that can be used. So we're going to keep a close eye on it. Last one, I think, before we jump into some solutions, is screen time addiction. So this problem with screen time addiction comes when we give our kids too many devices. We don't have time controls on them. We don't necessarily have a lot of rules on their social media devices, and they kind of have carte blanche. Now, I see some grandparents in here. Maybe you're here to help your son or daughter manage the technology because they're not doing so effectively. Or maybe you have teenagers and you're like, oh, they're 16. I'm pulling my hair out. It is not too late to tackle this problem. And of course, with God on our side, we can absolutely do anything. But screen time addiction basically happens because there's a chemical in your brain called dopamine. And dopamine is called the feel-good hormone. It's the hormone you get when you eat. It's the one that you get when you have sex. Um, it's the one you get when you run. Does anybody know what a runner's high is? Okay, obviously, I do not. <laughs> That's dopamine. And that says, this feels really good. Let's go do it again. So we go back and we eat at that all-you-can-eat salad bar. That didn't sound right. You, you go back and you do the things that produce the dopamine. Um, drugs, pornography, 
gambling are huge producers of dopamine. Well, when we give our kids social media and they're pulling that slot machine handle and they're getting more information, more information, new information, new information, and the dopamine levels rise, that's when the problem happens. And then we have the learning issues and we have some motivation issues and we have some addiction issues. And it's caused by a very, very real chemical imbalance that we allowed to happen because too much screen time. Dopamine's not something that the doctors and the scientists and the educators knew a whole lot about 10 or 15 years ago, but they're quickly becoming educated, as you can see with more and more kids on dopamine-regulating drugs, dopamine-regulating medication, because too much can cause problems. Whew, that's a lot of problems. Now, hopefully I scared you a little bit between sexting and, and, and pornography and screen time addiction, and now, so what are we gonna do about it? How can we manage the problem? So here's four rules to consider. Super easy rules. Number one, know their passwords. If you know their passwords, you can spy on them. I'm giving you permission, parents, that's okay. That's your job. You can see what they're doing. If you know their password and something happens, whether it's a bullying incident, whether it's a cheating incident, whether it's a sneaking incident, you know their passwords, you can figure it out, and then we don't have to go round and round in circles with the, with the lying or with the trying to trust issues. We just know what happened because they're doing this stuff on their phones. You gotta know their passwords. Um, does anybody keep all of their passwords on sticky notes under their keyboard? Yeah, some of you do. You don't wanna raise your hands. I love password apps. Now, when password apps first came out, I thought, no, 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 that's not a safe place to put all my passwords. So I only had one, right? It was the same for everything because I didn't want to remember a bunch of passwords. But the days of that, folks, those are long gone. You cannot have the same passwords for everything. So there's some password apps that you could have, that you could use. My favorite is Keeper. Now, when Keeper first came out, I'm like, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to put all my passwords on my phone. Then thumbprint technology came out. Then facial ID, where I can't open my phone with just my face, came out. And I'm like, OK, maybe I could put my passwords in. I've drugged my feet long enough. I can tell you now, after using Keeper for a three or four years, that it has changed everything. And if you're still opposed to something like that, um, you can go to Staples and pick up something like this. Right? We all had these in high school. We called them our little black books. It's a blue one, and it's five bucks at Staples, and it says passwords, usernames, passwords. It's ABCs on the right-hand side. You have to know your kids' passwords. If you know your kids' passwords, the, the drama around technology instantly goes down. My daughter might not friend that person because dad has my password. My son might not instant message that kid he wanted to because dad has my password. Um, the drama of getting my passwords lost or reset kind of goes away when we have them in an app or a book. So I'd highly recommend you do something to get yourself a password book. There's a list of links inside of the handout, and I believe I have this listed in there as something, so you don't have to necessarily write it down. Number two, remove technology at night. Okay, technology plus privacy equals trouble. So we put this rule in our house, you will not take technology in the bedroom. It was a rule from the beginning. When you put the rules in and the kids are very, very young, it's really easy, right? When you introduce the rules at 16, it's a little harder, but you still have hope. We introduced the rule very, very young, no technology in the bedrooms. That went very, very well for a few years. And then I walked upstairs, which there's never technology upstairs because that's where the bedrooms are. And my son was laying on the floor in the hallway with an iPad. And I said, what in the world are you doing? He says, I'm not in my bedroom. It's all good. <laughs> the rest of the family's downstairs, right? So now I, I had to rethink my rules a little bit. And I'm like, wait, time out. Um, yeah, you're right. You're not in the bedroom. So excellent. Way to go. Uh, hold on. Let me think about this. We had a thing on our, at our house called Technology Tuesdays where we talk about technology and apps and social media around the dinner table on, on Tuesdays. And I asked the kids, what's everybody doing and what's the cool thing now? And so the next time we had Technology Tuesday, I said, the rule's changing. I'm dad. I get to do that, right? Um, the new rule is no technology upstairs. Patted myself on the back. That was a great rule. No technology upstairs. It worked for a while. And then I heard this sound coming from the downstairs bathroom one day when I got home. 
doors shut. It's just noise, and I'm pounding on the door. What is going on in there? And my, my, my daughter that I have to keep a special eye on is in the, in the bathroom with an iPad. I said, what in the world are you doing in the bathroom? She goes, it's not the bedroom, and it's not upstairs. I said, but you have your pants around your ankles on a device that has a camera in a room with mirrors. Are you kidding me? Get out here. And the next time we had Technology Tuesdays, we had to change the rules again. So it's okay, folks, to change the rules. It's okay. The new rule was no technology behind closed doors. And that took care of everything. And that's the rule I'll give to you. If you have preschoolers, make that rule. No technology behind closed doors. Because technology plus privacy equals trouble. They don't look at porn and cheat and sext and, and bully and find online predators around the dinner table. And they don't do it in the back seat of the car on the way to school. They do it late at night when they have unlimited access to technology in a private place. So if you can get their password and you can take technology out of the private places of your house, you will be much, much better. So where do our devices live at night? They live in a basket that I found at a garage sale for five bucks. I've looked for this basket everywhere online, cannot find it, it's some kind of a letter basket. I have the charger back behind it with all of the cords kind of zip tied, which keeps mama happy. And the kids put their iPhones and their iPads in this and they charge at night. And sometimes they'll stand next to the basket for a very, very long time. <laughs> before going to bed, but when they do go to bed, and I usually go to bed after they do, not always, but sometimes, then I have access to see what they're doing and what they're downloading and who's saying what to whom and what they're going on their websites, because there it is. Where do they live at night? Hopefully not the bedroom. If they do live in the bedroom, there's a prayer group after this. No, just kidding. We, we want to do whatever we can to take them out of the bedroom. Location. So if we don't let them upstairs and we don't let them in the bedroom, where do we put them? So we took the computers during COVID that they were using for school and put them right smack in the living room, threw that couch in the trash can, moved things out of the way, got some desks. I got four kids, one in elementary, one in junior high, two were in high school, and they did school in the living room. And I watched some of their friends crash by doing school in their bedroom on their pajamas, half asleep. And, and so we learned something really big. Uh, and so we've kept that space. Our living room has not become a living room yet. It's still a school room and we like it. Because when I come home from work or when my wife comes home from work and we walk in, there they are on their devices. They might be playing a game. They might be watching YouTube. They might be doing homework, but they're all right there. And the influence I have as a parent has gone up because they're there. Now, it might mess up the feng shui of your house to put computers in the living space. Um, but that's okay because our job as parents is to keep them safe and to know what they're doing while they're in our charge. Last one is put it in writing. Now, this morning I posted on Facebook a cell phone contract that we gave our daughter um, and our son when they first got their first cell phone. So if you go onto Facebook during the boring parts of, of Jim's talk later on, um, you, you could search, um, Jim doesn't have any boring parts, I was just kidding. Uh, you can search Integrity Computer Concepts, that's my business name, Integrity Computer Concepts, and you'll see a post from today with a cell phone contract. And that cell phone contract has some rules. The first rule is it's my phone, I bought it, I'm letting you use it, aren't I the greatest? That's rule number one, let's just get it straight. The second and third and fourth rule are things like you will put it in the basket at 8.30. You will not send inappropriate pictures. You will answer the phone every single time mom or dad calls. You will not send me to voicemail. That's grounds for removal. The last rule is you're going to mess up, and I'm going to take your phone away, and I'm on your team, and we'll start over. We'll, this will work out. It's a great contract. So download it, use it. If you've already given your kid a phone, but you haven't put the ground rules in place, this is a great time to say, hey, I learned something new today. I learned that there are some things we can do with technology to make you safer and make me saner, wiser. And, and so we're going to sit down with this, and you're going to initial it. I'm going to initial it. We're going to hang it on the fridge. And it can take some of the drama away. They won't say, well, I didn't know 
I wasn't supposed to do that. I didn't know I had to answer your call. So I have took the 12 I don't knows and put them all on one piece of paper so that they know. Jim Burns will be the first to tell you that kids love boundaries. They do well with boundaries, but we have to tell them where they are. Okay, okay. I think the internet just went down. Here's a good video. The internet is down. <laughs> Something just happened in the world, and we have no idea what it was. <laughs> I know what we can do. We can go to a movie. Yes. <laughs> What's playing? I'm sorry? Playing the film? I, I don't know what's playing. I... I found a Thai place. Oh, good. Read a review. There's no review, it's just a phone number. How am I supposed to eat there if I don't know what other people think about it? <laughs> Come on! Work together, no, work together, work together. Do you have anything? No, I don't. Please come back here. I love you. I love you so much. Just come back, please, please. How are you? Fine. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. Oh, good. Yeah, good. We never do this anymore. No. <clears throat> I'm just gonna leave it up. Yeah. Just in case it does come back. Just to be sure. I need to let her know that I like this. I like, 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 like. Honey. It's not swiping. Come on. Is the internet back on? No. Is the internet back on? No. Is it back on? No. Back on? All I'm asking for you is to be funny. Play the keyboard. Just play the keyboard right now. Oh my gosh, what are we gonna do without the internet? Oh, love that. So here's some software you can use to manage technology at your house. There's three types of programs. There's programs that do filtering, there's programs that do monitoring, and there's programs that do time control. Now, when I started doing this, there were programs that did all three of these. And so if we wanted to do all three, we had to install three. And man, that was hard. And then kids got mobile devices. So now we got a computer and a phone. That's six programs because phone programs and computer programs weren't the same. How is a parent supposed to manage six programs to do this stuff? And these companies got wiser and smarter. And so now there's programs that do all three. And those are the ones I like. Not because they're the best at what they do, but because they make our lives easier. And if you use a program that's easy, you'll keep using it. If it's hard, you'll use it for a short time and then you'll forget about it. Um, so here's the three that we use most often. These are um, Custodio is the one on the top left, uh, Life360 in the top right, and the bottom one is called Screen Time. Screen Time is built into the iPhone, iPad, iOS ecosystem, and it just came out five or six years ago, and it is fabulous. It works very, very well. So let's talk about these. Custodio is free. They do have a paid version that you can put on lots of devices, but if you, if you just have one device, you can put Custodio on for free. Now, Custodio is what you use to manage your child's computer. It's not for phones, it's not for Androids, it's not for um, uh, uh, iPads, it's for computers. So our kids are still using computers, not nearly as much as they used to, but uh, um, a Chromebook, a laptop, a desktop, an, um, an Apple laptop, an iMac, a Windows computer, you're gonna use Custodio. Now, this is how it works. You put the app on your phone. So you have the Custodio app. They have the Custodio software, and it allows you from the app to manage their time. Computer shuts off at 10 o'clock manage their content, no adult pornography, and see how much they're using uh, on different websites. So I can manage their time, I can manage their content, and I can monitor where they're going. And I'm gonna show you by opening up um, the Custodio app on my phone in just a second, and we're gonna see what my son did this morning on his computer, which is always, always entertaining. All right, the next one, uh, by the way, Custodio will, like I said, block pornography, it controls games and apps, it sets time limits. I have Custodio on all four of my kids' computers. So I have one app that manages all four. Mom can do it, I can do it. And free for one child, 49 or 59 bucks a year for 10, 10 computers. 
and it's the best 59 bucks a year I spend on managing technology. Um, here's a little picture of what the app looks like on my phone where I can specify um, right here in the middle what time of day they can use the, the device, how much they used today, or how much they're allowed to use. So I can set all kinds of limits all from my phone. Custodio's got a weird name. It starts with a Q. And remember, you're not going to put Custodio on their mobile device. There's something else for that. Custodio is for their computer. The next one is Life360. Who uses Life360? Raise your hand. Lots of you. Do you like it? Say yes. Of course you do. Life360 is how we can track our kids. So the phone has more technology in it than the space shuttle did. Did you guys hear that? There is more memory, processing power, and technology in your back pocket right now than went up on the space shuttle when we were all in elementary school or junior high or maybe whatever. I'm not going to let my child walk around with that much technology and not know where it is. It's free. Life360 is free. I can see where they go for free. I just have to turn on the GPS. Oh, that's kind of strange, tracking your kids, Scott. No, it's not at all. You guys know what Find My Phone is, right? Find My Phone, and many of you use that to find somebody that's married to you. No, I'm just kidding. Life360 is Find My Phone on steroids. So Find My Phone tells you where they are right now. Life360 tells you where they were yesterday at 3 o'clock. So if I want to find out what time my 16-year-old son left school yesterday, or if he actually went back to campus after lunch on Wednesday, Life360 does that. Now, we don't use Life360 in a nefarious, mischievous, weird way at our house. We, 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 we say we're watching each other's back. I'm not looking over your shoulder. I'm watching your back. You know where I am. I know where you are. As mom or dad, I can turn off my locations with Life360 if I choose to. But in the contract, when they got the phone, it said you will have Life360, you will use it, you will not turn on, and you will like it. <laughs> and they agreed because they'll agree to anything when they get their first phone, won't they? And you will wash my car every day. Okay, dad, just give me a phone. And you will keep this Life360. Okay, dad, no problem, just give me a phone. They'll agree to anything. Life360 is fabulous. The third one is screen time. Now, because the majority of the mobile devices that we're using these days are iPhones, I'm gonna do a little demonstration on what you can do with an iPhone or an iPad. I'm also gonna share um, the program that we use for Androids in just a second called Phenomo. It's in the handout if, you, if your child has an Android device, but the iPhone software allows you to do monitoring. I can see what websites they go to. It allows me to do time control. I can shut the phone off at 10 o'clock, and it allows me to filter and it's built into the phone, and it's managed by your phone. So your phone manages their devices. So if they have an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, any of those Apple devices, including a laptop, um, then screen time is fantastic. It has progressed over the years to be from okay to pretty darn good. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna throw my phone um, up on the screen and give you a little demonstration, and we'll see if my wife went to Starbucks today. <laughs> Just kidding. She did, of course. <laughs> All right, here's my phone. So you'll see down here in the lower right, I have Keeper. I have it on the front page because I use it all the time. That's where my passwords live. That's how I keep myself sane. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, Life360 first, and let's see what we got. So there's the Burnett family. The Burnett family is a little bit spread out today. I live in Corona, so a couple of my kids are in Corona. I'm in Chino, and I got one up in Yosemite on a hiking trip near Hume Lake with her CBU life group. Yes! Parent win for the day. Have fun. Let's go see where my wife is. So I'm going to scroll, and I'm going to find Carrie. And Carrie is at home right now. And in the lower right-hand corner, I have this little dot. This kind of gives me the path where my kids went for the day. And I can go to yesterday. And I can go to the day before. And I can zoom in and see what time she bought me this new hat at Bass Pro Shops. It's a great app. 
We don't do it to track each other. We do it to keep each other safe. There's a GPS built into this. They go on the internet no matter where they are, has more technology than the space shuttle. I'm going to use it to the best of my ability. Life360 has a free version and a paid version. We use the free version for years, years and years. And the free version allows you to see where the other people are in your family for that day only. And when my daughter got her driver's license, we upgraded to the paid version because now I could see where they were the day before. And my kids don't mind it. It's, there's no weirdness about it. Uh, it is a great, great program for helping keep your family safe. Let's take a look at the one right next to it. It's the green one. Oh, my phone went off. Oh, it's back. Nope. Let's get my phone back up on the screen. <clears throat> the next one I'm going to show you is called Custodio, and that's the one where I can see where my kids are going on their computers. I can set time controls for the computers, uh, and I can shut them off if I want to or just look at their web history. So if we can get my phone back up, it's not connecting to the Wi-Fi. Is there an IT guy around here somewhere? <laughs> Come on. Let's make sure this is connected. And let's try one more time. Hey, there it is. <laughs> so I'm a technology guy, and I go into people's homes, and they're like, it wasn't working before you got here. And now it's working. And I say, technology is just scared of me. So that's what happened just now. I'm going to click on Custodio in the upper left-hand corner. This is the one I use to manage their computers. And I'm going to click on Zach in the lower left corner. And Zach has used his computer for 52 minutes today. I can see what time he used his computer. I can see what websites he went to. If I scroll down, I can look and see what he searched on Google. How to hot bake the Bauer Supreme S170 skate. So I have hockey players in my house. This is a very normal Google search. Unlike Kara, who has volleyball players who do not touch each other, my kids get high fives when they touch other players by everybody on their bench. And the harder they touch them, the better the high five. He obviously got new ice skates. He has a game today in Anaheim, which I'll be going to afterwards. So he's figuring out how to bake his skates, which is much better than figuring out how to bake some brownies. I haven't found that online yet with him. Uh, these are fantastic. If I click on the YouTube history, it'll show me the video he watched. And I can do this with any of my kids. And because I can, not that I do, but because I can, and they know I can, it helps them make good decisions. Just like when I put the drug test kit on the kitchen counter but didn't say a word. I just left it there for three days. Jesus was in the grave for three days. The drug test kit was on the counter for three days. Didn't say a word, but I guarantee you every one of my kids saw it. And someday they'll be somewhere where somebody will offer them a hit of something. And they'll say, I'd love to, but I can't because my dad's got a drug test kit. I gave them a tool for their back pocket. It's a trick I learned from Jim Burns. All right, let's move on to another one, screen time. It's the... The, the program, the app that I use to manage their mobile devices, and I'm going to go into settings, and then I'm going to go down to screen time, and then I'm going to go down to my kids. And the funnest one to look at would be um, Zach again. So we'll just open up Zach, and I can see that he's used his phone for eight minutes so far today. Oh, just jumped 29 minutes because it did a little update. And if I click see all activity, I can scroll down and see he spent 49 minutes on text messages, five minutes on Instagram. I can see his daily averages. I can see what his limits are. This is a fantastic free thing that you can do to manage your child's mobile devices. And the one for the Android is called Phenomo. I can't demonstrate it today, but it's very, very similar to this iPhone one. Um, if I go down, I can set uh, downtime. which is when I want the phone to turn off. And when grades and respect go down, so does the downtime. 
And we change it all the time, and things change in our house, and you can adjust when the phone turns off. Um, I can turn on restrictions, so I can um, set it so that uh, pornography is not allowed. I can even say, don't allow Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, or YouTube websites. Because you know, I'll put a a 30-minute limit on YouTube, and when his YouTube limit is done, he'll go over to Safari and go to the YouTube website. So if you put limits on apps that also have websites, like YouTube and Instagram, make sure you block the website from being accessed, like I did right down there at the bottom. So these programs aren't super complex. Screen time for the phones, mobile devices, custodial for the computers, Life360, great apps to use um, to manage technology in your home. Um, Let me get this off the screen, and let's move on. Phenomo is the one I told you is for Android devices. It's 19 bucks. It's a one-time fee. It does the same thing. Manages the apps on an Android device, uh, and it works really, really good. For the Chromebook, you can use Custodio, or you can use what Google has built in, and there's links in the handout to all of these. Um, Or you can use the one that's built into Google called Family Link. Now, Apple has screen time. Google has family link. It's the same. If you are a Google family where you have Chromebooks and Android phones, you want to use um, family link. And if you have more Apple devices, you want to stick with screen time. Now, we're, mo- we're getting towards the end here, and then we're going to do some Q&A. Um, uh, Ken, what time do we need to start Q&A? Five minutes ago? No, no, you're good. Last five minutes. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to start talking a little bit faster. Mirroring is how we manage our, if we wanted to monitor our child's text messages. We do what's called mirroring. Don't fall for any app that tells you that it'll allow you to read your child's text messages. They don't work. When Apple invented the two-factor authentication, all of that broke. So now we do mirroring. So my daughter had an old iPad mini, right? She had an iPad mini, and when she got a new phone, she kind of stopped using the mini. And the mini had her Apple ID and iCloud set up along with her phone, so they were mirrored together. And when she stopped using the mini, it magically disappeared into my closet, where it has lived for three and a half years. And the mini is a mirror of my daughter's phone. And if I needed to see the web history or the contacts or the text messages, I could. And quite frankly, I'm not positive it even turns on anymore. She's now in college. But my point is, when I needed to make sure the new boyfriend was texting appropriate things and mom wanted to check to make sure that appropriate communication was happening, we mirrored it with a device she didn't know about. Everybody has an old iPod, iPad, iPhone, old Crackberry, something that you can mirror with your child's mobile device in order to read text messages. So it's the quickest, easiest way to do that. So here's three hardware devices that you can use to manage your home. Circle is this little guy that plugs into your router, okay? And Circle by Disney um, has an app for your phone. And it allows you to see all the devices on your home network and then block them. So I can turn off the Xbox, or I can block Netflix, or I can limit Snapchat on a specific device. Now, this is really, really good for young children. And the reason why it's great for young children and not teenagers is because teenagers figure out that if you walk over to Circle and unplug it, it can't babysit the network. And so I've had clients go as far as put Circle in a safe with a hole in the side of it to keep Circle safe. (laughs) Get it? That was a play on words. But um, it's great because little kids don't understand all that. So you just kind of hide it, you connect it to your home router, and then Circle gives you an app for the phone, and you can block and allow and do things like that. And the cool thing about Circle is it'll tell you how much time was spent on the Xbox, the Windows computer, the Android phone, or the Nest thermostat, anything that's connected to the internet. Uh, It's a pretty cool little device for families with young kids. Kindle Paperwhite is one of my favorite devices for teenagers as far as technology in the bedroom. My daughter said, well, I want an iPad to read books in the bedroom like mom does. 
We said, no, you do not want an iPad for your bedroom to read books. You want an iPad for your bedroom to do everything else except read books. So we found the Kindle Paperwhite. It doesn't do texting. It doesn't do internet. It doesn't do games. It just does books. And we've given our kids Kindle Paperwhites so they can have this technology in their bedroom to read books. And it's worked very, very well because our daughter who downloaded 20 or 30 books when she was a teenager passed it on to the next kid who already had 20 or 30 age-appropriate books who passed it on to the next kid. So this is one piece of good technology that I would allow in the bedroom. So video games, how do we manage video games? How do we put screen time on things that aren't computers? This is how, are you guys ready for this? Everybody looking up? Take a deep breath, it's, it's right here. This is the price of admission, right? Right here. This, <laughs> yes sir. This is an Atari 2600 wood grained and I own it. And it is in my garage. And one day I pulled it out of the cardboard box it was in and I plugged it in and I tried to figure out how to hook the antenna up. What the heck antenna on the back? There's a slider bar. Finally, I got it connected and I stuck in pole position. And pole position is a game where the car sits in the middle of the screen and doesn't move, but the road moves. The car doesn't move, and I'm playing pole position. I'm like, boys, come on, get in here. This is so great. I'm loving this. You got you to see this. This is fantastic. And we started playing pole position in the garage. And they said, well, Dad, ha, ha, how do you play with your friends? And I'm like, what are you talking about, play with your friends? This doesn't connect to the Internet. This is from 1984. And they said, we're going to go outside now and play, Dad. And I'm like, yes. That is awesome, and it went back in the box. We did, however, find another device called Bob, and when we got Bob, we then bought our first PlayStation. We didn't get a PlayStation until Bob came out. What we figured out with Bob, it's a very, very old school device, and what Bob does is plugs into the wall, and the Xbox plugs into the back of Bob with a key. And this controls the power to the Xbox. And so when I program this for one hour a day or two hours on Saturday, 30 minutes a day between 4 and 5 p.m. or whatever I do, my son walks up and types in his code and it goes beep. And now we can turn on the Xbox because now the Xbox has power. This is totally old school and it works great. And each of my kids have a code and sometimes they sell their code to their sibling. <laughs> and if you know anything about Fortnite, you'll know that you do not want the Xbox to turn off at the end of Fortnite if you are one of the last couple of players. And one time I heard bloody screams coming from the garage. Bob is beeping. Beep, beep, beep. That means you have 60 seconds left. And in Fortnite, you play with 50 or 60 players and you, you battle each other until there's only one or two left. And if you win Fortnite, it's like a trophy. And my son is playing Fortnite and there's one other person in the Fortnite room and there's 60 seconds. And I walk in the garage, Dad! And I walked over and typed in my code and it gave him some extra time and we laugh about it today. Um, but Bob has done great for us. Bob allows us to give the, the boys some game time in a limited fashion. And again, we have it in the garage, so it's in a more public space than the bedroom. But um, one thing that worries me about these video games is just an uncontrollable amount of time. Bob is available for 69 or 79 bucks on Amazon. That's the only place you can buy Bob. You'll type in Bob screen time controller. And you can control any device that you can plug in. You can control your, your wife's... Uh, curling iron, you can control a television. Yeah, I've got three minutes on her curling iron, and that's it, three minutes, it's done. We gotta go places, man. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking and I've never tried it. That would be death to me. You can have all the time you want. I, I will wait happily in the car. Here's my final tips and we're gonna do some Q&A. Here's my final tips. Do not be afraid to change some rules, folks. I gave you a lot of rules, potential rules. I, I see a lot of you with your phones out. I'm super excited, but it's in the handout. So that's just tidbit. Take technology away at night because technology plus privacy equals trouble. 
Get your kids' passwords. Go home, sit down, say, kids, I learned something new. I should have done this when you were nine, but I'm doing this now. Please forgive me. I'm not the perfect parent, but I'm working on it. I need your passwords. And then that's just what happens. Um, They're not always easy to get, but you'll figure it out. Consider using some software to help manage the technology. We talked about screen time, Life360, Custodio, Family Link, Block, um, uh, Bloxy. I didn't mention Bloxy. Is, it, is Bloxy in the list of links? Does anybody know? Can someone look? Yes? Someone said yes. Okay. Bloxy is a fantastic um, Chromebook filter. It's just a filter. It's for Chromebooks. It's free, and it works really, really well. So keep that in mind. Um, and, or, or a hardware device like like um, the Kindle Paperwhite or Circle or Bob. So there's lots of things that we can do to manage technology. But ultimately, we have to remember that God loves our kids more than we do, and he loved them long before we did. So where we fail as parents or come short, we have to trust that God's going to take over. So we're going to constantly pray that God will keep an eye on them where we can't. We're going to do what we can. We're going to step up our technology game, but we're also just going to circle up bring in other parents to help us, go to things like this that can teach us, um, and trust God. So I think we have five or ten minutes left. Um, I'd love to field some technology questions, and then we get to eat lunch.